Good morning. Climate change was in the news this week. 16-year-old Swedish teenager Greta Thunberg presented an impassioned accusation. She said the current generation of leaders, world leaders, was failing her generation because they were not adequately addressing the issue of climate change. Her speech has gone viral on social media. There are many responses to her speech. There was a professor that wrote why Singaporeans would not understand what she spoke about because of our social norms. I listened to her speech. I thought to myself, there is at least some truth that each generation is entrusted with decisions that impact the next. At least that truth is apparent. We have many decisions that impact our next generation. For us as believers, for us who name the name of Jesus Christ, the stakes are higher. They're not just physical, earthly climate issues. We are entrusted with the gospel, the announcement of major good news. The impact is not just temporary, is not just earthly, is not just physical. This is good news of eternal significance of a rescue that goes beyond human proportions. This is the truth of the eternal rescue of a sovereign God for men who betrayed him. This is the hope of eternal relationship, the base which explains everything in life. If you're a doctor, sometimes you wonder why you're helping people. I hope it's not because you get paid a salary. If you're a teacher, you sometimes wonder why you teach. Again, I hope you're not there just because you want to earn the money. As a student, if we don't realize God's role for students in our learning journey of life, we will just get absorbed in the grades that come. The gospel impacts all of life. It has at its roots a perfect sovereign God. And I dare you to say today, there is no need for such a God. Because if there is no need for such a God, if there's no need for a Savior who redeems, then you might as well say you don't need any law and order. And the guy who steals and robs should just be patted on the back because basically there is no God. Do whatever you want. Not a single person, I dare say, in this room would say self-determination at all costs. We recognize that, and yet we come to the truth of the gospel that God would rescue betrayers. This is the beautiful message of good news epic proportions entrusted to us. That's the message of 1 Timothy. Paul tells his disciple, Timothy, preserve, protect, and pass on the true gospel. I was thinking as Greta Thunberg was delivering that speech, whether we would be as impassioned, as daring, as courageous, as crucially communicative. This theme, Preserve, Protect and Pass, is a PPC's original distinctively Singaporean series theme inspired by our youth favorite game, Captain's Ball. Preserve, Protect, Pass. The 22 messages on our website were preached in this series in 2017. Just to be clear, because we live in a throwaway culture, this is not passing on second-hand goods, yeah? You know, we live in a culture where we have plenty, so we use some things for a while, especially our electronic goods, we don't want it anymore, we just pass it on. Now, this is not 
the concept of convenient recycling without thinking. I was laughing when I saw this article this morning in the Straits Times. The Malacca NGO asked why Singapore's old Deepa Valley decorations are being used for the city's Little India. Uh, apparently, they were put up with the Singapore signs and sponsors too. The Malacca Consumer and Environmental Association said it had received many calls from locals who had seen the decorations on the city's Jalan Bendahara, which carried the logos of Singapore telcos and government agencies. I mean, I reserve my comments. We don't comment on social political issues here. But, but the concept of preserving, protecting, and passing on the gospel is not like this. It's not recycling without thinking. Instead, when we preserve, protect, and pass on the true faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the idea is of a family treasure passed on from generation to generation. My parents are here this morning. I thought of them this week. It's a privilege to spend some time with them. They're growing older, as are we all. I thought about the things that they taught me, and they taught me many things. But above all, the most precious, the most significant, the most helpful and impactful of what they passed on to me was the true faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not just by what they said. Yes, they told me the gospel. It's by how they behaved. It's by how they lived. Paul tells Timothy how the church of God is organized matters. This is a pastoral epistle. He's telling Timothy, how to organize the church of God to preserve, protect, and pass on the true gospel. In what is perhaps the theme verses of 1 Timothy chapter 3, he says, I'm hoping to come to you, but I'm writing you to do this thing so that if I wait long, if you, you won't see me immediately, you know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. Why? Because that is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Discipleship is ultimately housed in the cradle of the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The pastoral epistle tells Timothy how to organize the household of God. That's why in this epistle from chapters 2 to 6, you see all of these subjects, public prayer and worship, role of women, leadership and appointment of officers, overseer and deacons, relationships among people in church, care for widows and needy, and how we are to perceive the present challenges of culture, of rich and riches, practical aspects of church life, guarding the gospel. Each of these aspects involve a response to the culture at Ephesus. Culture has a lot to say about relationships and practice. The wrong philosophy, as I've said before, is whatever the culture wants is good for the church. Equally wrong philosophy is whatever the culture has is bad for the church. Paul responds by saying, it is what God wants that is most important. Sense the culture. The culture is neutral. It's either we reject it or we accept it according to the Bible. Chapter 2 to 6 deals with these practical aspects of the church, but today, today's message is from chapter 1. The perfect patience of Jesus Christ. This is the very heart and soul of the gospel. This phrase, the perfect patience of Jesus Christ, comes directly from the text. In verse 16, Paul says, For this reason I obtain mercy, that in me, first, Jesus Christ might show forth all perfect patience, for a pattern, a word picture, to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul says there's a reason why I obtain mercy. It's a demonstration of the perfect patience of Jesus Christ. We say, Pastor, explain that phrase. Well, to fully unpack this phrase, we have to understand that the context, the context at Ephesus, why Timothy was left there, was because false teaching had entered the church. 
What did that include? Verse 5 and 7 tells us there were myths and endless genealogies. There was a misuse of the law. So there was syncretism, a, a mixing of the culture, a desire to incorporate Greco-Roman fascinations, uh, Greco-Roman fascinations with myths and endless genealogies. And then there was a misuse of the law, either hyper-grace or hyper-legalism. There are two sections to chapter 1. The first, Paul tells Timothy, you need to teach rejection of false teaching. Warn all those who are there, don't teach, don't learn false teaching. Why? It promotes the wrong focus. The focus of the gospel is love, not just empty argument. You know, you know how people are arguing all the time about this and that, and the theories of this and that? and the wording of this and that. It means uses God's law. Gospel has an effect. It is life change. It is not legalism. It is not all hyper grace, which leads to antinomianism. When false teaching comes, particularly influenced by negative aspects of the culture, we must shout out, that's not the gospel. Stop confusing us. Stop confusing our generations. Because the real gospel changes lives. In this second section of chapter 1, Paul gives his own testimony. He says, I was Saul, the legalistic Christian killer. I became Paul, God's missionary to the Gentiles. He begins this section with a transition statement from verse 11. He says, The glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. What is that glorious gospel? I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. What was I before? I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul is telling his own story of the gospel of Jesus Christ in his life. He's sharing his testimony. Paul's whole life was changed before he used to be the most wicked, the most hated, he was a Christian killer. He, he went to seek out those who belonged to Jesus Christ and he persecuted and killed them. Imagine the things he would say. Perhaps he was, would use the most hateful language against Christians. He would chase them down like wild animals, putting them in jail, putting them to death. He, he was a Jew of the Jews, right? He tells us, I was trained as a Jew. And as a Jew, he did not believe in Jesus. He thought ignorantly he was doing God a favor by hunting down Christians. He said, I blindly did these things as an enemy, not just an enemy of Christians, but of Christ himself. You remember when a great light shone on the Damascus road and it shone directly at the Apostle Paul, Jesus Christ himself confronted Paul, who was then Saul. And Jesus asked him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It wasn't just persecuting believers. He was persecuting Christ. At that time, Paul was Saul, and Saul says, Who are you, Lord? <laughs> he, he didn't even know. And Jesus, I'm the Lord, I'm the Jesus whom you persecuted. I mean, Saul was blind in his ignorance. He didn't know Jesus. He did terrible things against Jesus. But he obtained mercy. Jesus met him. Jesus saved him. Jesus chose him to serve as the greatest missionary, telling others about this Jesus of the 27 books of the New Testament, we know he wrote 13. 
We've been reading all of them. We will read all of them except Romans this year. He may have written Hebrews, we're not sure. The Bible is silent. If he did, if he did it's 14, but 13 is what we have. The real gospel changes lives. Praise God. Jesus gives new purpose from Saul to Paul. The whole purpose of his life was changed. Previously, he was in unbelief. Now he was a believer, full of faith. He was faithful. He was trustworthy. Before, he was a blasphemer, speaking against Christ. Now, Paul the preacher is speaking of Christ. Before, he was a persecutor of Christians, but now Paul, the encourager and shepherd of believers. Before, Saul seeking to injure Christ. He says, I was injurious. Seeking to injure his name. But now, Paul, whose whole life and mission is to live for Christ and make him known. Only the real gospel gives real blessing because only Jesus Christ can change lives. How is your purpose of life today? What is your purpose for life today? Paul says, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. He says, the life that I now live, I live for the sake of the one who loved me and gave himself for me. The motivations of his choices reflect his purpose. We sit here as believers today, a real gospel has changed our life. We have a new purpose. We are no longer like others who live purely for ourselves. Paul says, listen, the real gospel changes lives. It's not academic. It's not a matter for academic argument. The gospel is not here for you to develop nice theories and syncretize it with culture. The real gospel changes lives. Jesus gives new purpose and Jesus grants full forgiveness. Forgiveness is a foreign concept in our world today. We are very unforgiving. In our performance-driven world, we often do this even in our own families. Well, why you didn't get, why you didn't get A? Why you get B plus? Oh, you fell short, uh, your KPI. Let's have a chat. We do a 360 KPI, right? Forgiveness is very foreign in our culture. Paul says the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He says, this is a trustworthy, this is a statement worthy of belief. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sin sinners. He came to save those who betrayed him. He came to forgive them. That's what he said on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. The heart of the gospel, the very purpose of why Jesus left heaven and came into this world is to save sinners like us. Paul says, of whom I am chief. Paul feels the weight of it. He says, look, I was the worst of sinners, the chief of sinners. And Jesus Christ came to save me. And here comes our phrase. For this reason, I obtain mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all perfect patience. For a pattern, a word picture to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. And Paul says, you know the reason why I obtain such great mercy? You know why it's me that is the chief of sinners that, that Jesus Christ saved? He says, the reason is that in my testimony shows you that Jesus can save all sinners. I'm the chief. There is a pattern, there's a word picture here. To all who hereafter believe on him to everlasting life, 
there is a specific purpose, Christ showed mercy to me, because Paul is a prime example of the application of Christ's redemption. The worst sinner, the chief of all sinners, the greatest Christian killer. I mean, you think of him perhaps as worse than the people in history that have killed many people. There have been many, right, in history. World War II, famous people. They have put people to death. Think of, think of Paul as that when he was Saul. The worst of the worst. And the wonderful fact, the wonderful truth, is that Jesus Christ came to save him. What perfect patience. I mean, you and I are so unlike Jesus. We would say, you did something, you deserve it, right? You did something wrong, go to jail. You deserve it, ma. Particularly when you do something wrong against me, you deserve it even more. <laughs> when Jesus Christ confronted him on the road to Damascus, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Oh, this was direct. Saul was persecuting Christ. And yet, Jesus Christ, in his perfect patience, didn't just kill Paul on the spot. You know, on the road to Damascus, it could have been case closed, right? Bright light shone. Who are you, Lord? Ka! Finish. Bye bye. You deserve it, what? You persecute me, no? Why should I give you a chance? Why should I bother when you slaughtered so many of my people? You should be killed. But this is the perfect forbearance. This is the perfect long suffering. This is the perfect patience. The patience that leads to turning of people that Jesus can forgive them. We are so unlike that, aren't we? We want justice now. Kill him. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam first sinned, and Eve first sinned, who was it that went to seek who? I mean, is it recorded that Adam and Eve went to seek out God? <laughs> Or they were hiding. It was God that sought them out. Yes, he gave judgment as he should, but even in punishment there was a promise. Who clothed them? Who sent them out of the Garden of Eden so that they would not be like this for the rest of life? Doesn't something alarm you that in Genesis there is no record of repentance by Adam and Eve? There is a singular absence of what we would expect, an order of things to happen, right? There's sin, there should be repentance, and then there's forgiveness, and then there's blessing, right? But you read Genesis 3. And yet a long-suffering, merciful gracious God, a spectacular God, a God who blows your mind, who is so unlike us, extends his perfect patience. Why then, pastor, why is this phrase as the perfect patience of Jesus Christ? Why not just say the perfect patience of God? Because Jesus Christ is the one whom Saul persecuted. He was the saviour that Saul rejected. This is not just the general mercy of God to all. This is the specific long-suffering and patience of Jesus Christ towards those who reject him. 
when you are sitting here and some of you may have not heard this before. Some of you may tell me, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. Yes, I don't know what you've done. But God knows what you've done and Jesus knows what you've done and anything you've done is against Him. And He comes to you today and He says, why are you persecuting me? Would you see His perfect patience? Would you receive His mercy? Would you respond? Jesus gave Saul the opportunity to respond, to believe. Believe in the Jesus whom he persecuted. He gave a chance. Paul says that's, that's the pattern. That's a word picture to all the rest who should thereafter believe in Jesus Christ. This is the exact person of the Godhead who died for us. Do you realize that? <laughs> You know, as a bystander, we say, Yala, forgive him. La. Right? Cost me nothing, right? Forgive him. La. No, no, no. This is, the, this is the Savior who gave everything. This is the one who died. This is the one who came and left everything. We would say, why bother? But he left everything to come. He lived an earthly life. He took the form of a servant for you and me. He displayed the perfection of who he was, the virgin-born Son of God. Then he went to the cross and he took your sin and my sin on himself. So much so that he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was separated from God for us. We would be so different and say, why bother? I wouldn't live a single finger to help people who couldn't care less about truth than about God. But here we are confronted with a word picture of the perfect patience of Jesus Christ. Today, if you're sitting here and you say, look, pastor, I'm rotten. I've done these many things. I've even tried to take my own life. There is no hope. I tell you on the basis of Scripture, not my opinion. Oh, yes, there is hope. Look at Paul. Look at Saul. The worst of the worst. I mean, my guess is that you have not hunted down and killed many, many, many Christians. My guess is you may have never even killed one person. And the point is, even if we have, Paul says, I did it out of ignorant unbelief. And so my hope is when I believe there is the perfect patience and long-suffering mercy of the one in whom I believe, of the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself to die for me. More than enough more than enough. Oh yes, He will save you. Oh yes, there is hope. If you turn and believe, hear the voice of Jesus confronting your soul. Bow. Receive His mercy. Receive His grace. What is the impact of the word picture? What is the response? And for us who believe, Paul said these words out of a deep conviction, out of a great gratitude to Jesus Christ, his Savior. You know, the sense of repentance corresponds with the understanding of the enormity of our sin. And Paul feels the weight of it. He says, I'm the chief of sinners. The gratitude that shines from his heart because... He remembers. He feels it. It reminds me of an account during the time of Jesus at the house of Simon the Pharisee. And Jesus had been invited to his house for dinner and then I remember there was a lady whom, whom people knew she was a sinner. 
And then she came and what did she do? She broke a jar of perfume and stood behind Jesus. She was weeping and she, she used her hair to wash the feet of Jesus. Luke 7 tells us the response. When the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, uh, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. I mean, Simon was judging her, wasn't he? Now, what did Jesus say? He told a parable. He says there was a certain man, a creditor, he had two, two debtors, two people who owed him money. One owed him 500 denarii, the other owed him 50. And he forgave their debt. He says, okay, you have nothing left to repay. And Jesus asked, tell me, which of them will love him more? And Simon says, well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus says, look, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. I mean, is it true that Simon is less of a sinner than a woman? Is it true? Did, she, did, she, did he commit less sins than a woman? Sometimes we are, we are confronted with these thoughts. Yeah, he's a Pharisee. Maybe he's sinless. Hey, brothers and sisters, the truth is that all of us are sinners. Far be it from you and me to great sin, you know? The ones who are dirty try to grade the, I'm, I'm less dirty than you. <laughs> I, I, I have less pigmentation on my face than you. <laughs> we are all sinners. There is no one perfect. But what makes the difference? The difference is that the woman understands. The woman understood better the enormity of the grace of God in his forgiveness for her. Because she understood she was a rotten sinner, that Jesus forgave her, she loved much. This is not a parable to tell us that only those who are sinners are very bad and need Jesus. This is a parable to tell us that many of us behave like Simon the Pharisee. We think we are so good, right? Pastor, Saul was a persecutor of Christians. I'm not. I don't take drugs, I don't murder, I don't cheat. You missed the whole point. You've just become Simon the Pharisee. This may be an issue with many of us who grew up in Christian homes. You know, we call them, we call ourselves second generation, third generation believers. I mean, from young, we are taught to do right, so when we believe in Jesus, we don't kind of see some dramatic change in our lives, right? Things go on just as they were. We're kind of, I'm not so bad. Hey, don't miss the point. Don't become Simon the Pharisee. Oh, that, that lady, big, big, big sinner, so that lady needs Jesus. I, I'm okay. Those who know the enormity of our sin have the advantage of greater love and gratitude. You, you know, I meet many of our people for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I met one of our brothers at least about three, four years ago now, there's something that he said that sticks in my mind that keeps me humble. <laughs> he said, Pastor, there's one thing that I'm encouraged by you when you say this. I say, okay, right, well, what is it that encourages you? I'm, I'm eager to hear. He says, you say that you regard yourself as a sinner. And you said before, like Paul, you're the chief of sinners. Yes, brother, I do. I do consider myself the chief of sinners. I know my own heart. It is utterly deceitful. It is desperately wicked. And Christ has saved me by his perfect patience. He's given me a chance. He didn't kill me on the spot. Whenever I think of the mercy of a Savior who took my place of punishment and says, I forgive you, It is then that I praise God from the depths of my heart. And that's what Paul does. He breaks out into doxological praise. How unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And we respond 
Amen, because truly it is so when we consider the mercy granted to us as sinners. How wonderful it is, how stupendous, how great a transcendent God, the only God, should come into the world to save sinners in the marvelous act, display of His mercy for His eternal glory. I mean, the form of this is doxology. The outburst of a heart that's surcharged with feeling. And this is not just Paul's experience. It is a word picture. It is an example for all of us who thereafter come to believe. What's your heart this morning? The real gospel changes lives. We praise God. You know, when I feel that I live my deepest, darkest moments, when I feel nobody understands, when I feel I'm going through the circumstances which could have been a thousand times better, what gives me the blessing of hope and peace? What gives me the comfort to look up and say, praise God? It is the truth that the real gospel changes lives, that Jesus gives new purpose and Jesus grants full forgiveness. What are your circumstances this morning? This week has not been easy for many of our people. But would you focus on the truth of the gospel and praise God? There's another application. To complete the chapter, we must not avoid the final application of the same truth, same section. This is the second part of 1 Timothy 1. A real gospel, a real blessing. The real gospel changes lives, praise God. And then he reminds Timothy, I put you here because there's false teachers. The real gospel is worth fighting for. Watch out. You fight for the real blessing of the real gospel. The war is fought on two levels, outside and inside. When the Bible talks about the old man and new man struggling, it's not talking about an outer war, it's talking about an inner spiritual struggle. There are repeated warnings in the pastoral epistles to Timothy to guard his own heart. And we all need to watch out. You know, there's so many people that appear to be outwardly performing successfully, but disasters on the inside look good on the outside doesn't mean we are clean on the inside the war is fought fought inside ourselves let's be authentically real let's not be hypocrites we come here on sunday we all look good in our hearts have we treasured to protect preserve and pass on the real gospel that's worth fighting for watch out what we believe should dictate how we behave, right? That's the thrust of 1 Timothy, how the church behaves is going to preserve, protect, and pass on the true gospel. You know, sometimes we come here and we know Jesus has forgiven us. And yet, in the recesses of our heart, there are people that we struggle to forgive. We think in ourselves, that person, he did this and this to me. A real gospel is worth fighting for. Watch out for our hearts. Fight for the real blessing of the real, real gospel. Jesus gave us new purpose, full forgiveness. Don't go back to the losing side. It says, this charge I commit unto you, son Timothy, very, very strong. According to the prophecies which went before on thee, these gospel truths that you have, and thou might then might war a good warfare, holding on to the faith and a good conscience, which some having put away, have, having rejected concerning faith, hath made shipwreck. It says, listen, Timothy, you are third generation, right? Your grandmother was a believer, your mother was a believer, the third generation. If you don't hold on to the faith of the gospel, if you don't hold on to the gospel truth and a good conscience, how you act and behave and illustrate the gospel truth. The consequences are disastrous. In Acts 24, Paul says, Here am I, and what do I do? I exercise myself to have a 
clear conscience between God and man. And that's precious. You know, many of us want to appear good before men. We want to be well thought of by our boss, by our colleagues, by our family, by our classmates. But that's not the real blessing of the gospel. The real blessing of the real gospel is that on the inside, we have a good conscience. These two weapons go together, the faith and a good conscience. We hold our faith according to gospel truths. We combine the right understanding with the proper response, the proper behavior. Our faith must be applied. We must not only say we believe, we must demonstrate the correct moral self-evaluation in our lives. Faith and a good conscience go hand in hand. Put away is a strong verb. Reject. A violent and deliberate rejection. There are people that do this when they say, yeah, you know, pastor, I still believe, but you know, it doesn't impact my life. I worry. If you do this, you end up with a severe spiritual condition. The word is shipwreck. You think the captain wanted to end up like that? You think the captain of the ship wanted the ship to become like that? The fact is, he got it wrong. He made a mistake. Okay, shipwrecks happen because mistakes are made. Today, we're sitting here, and Jesus Christ, the perfectly patient, the perfectly merciful Savior, Some of you would say, oh yeah, I believe in my head, but you know, my life, I control my own life. Lah. Come on, pastor, get real. I decide what I want. Jesus, well, yeah, he's a good savior. Thank you, Jesus. But no impact on my life. I'm not sure you have a good conscience. It's not just a profession of your lips. It's a demonstration in our lives. I speak to you as a second generation, third generation. I'm one of them. Has our lack of a sense of the gratitude of the love for a Savior who is truly perfectly patient with us, has the lack of that eaten into our lives such that we think we can run our own lives the way we want to live it without the good conscience of the faith? Yesterday I was at one of our members' house. I was so happy to hear his testimony. He preserved a good conscience. You know, he had been looking for this job for many years. It was his ideal job. And he went through all the interviews, big company, great prospects. He got the job. He was selected. But he and his wife, in five months, they were relocating to Canada for one year. And I was with him when he made those decisions and he, you know, he made that decision clear to himself. He says, I need a good conscience. I need to tell this guy who's about to hire me and I'm leaving in five months. Now, he could have kept quiet. You know, he could have reasoned in his own heart, you know, Singapore, caveat emptor, right? Sign the contract, my contractual right. I just have to give you termination, notice X many months. I'm good. I can get the job. After five months, I quit. I said, that's not a good conscience. I said, praise the Lord. Some of us would choose differently. Some of us may respond to the impact of culture that says it's okay one. Caveat emptor, contractual rights. As a lawyer, purely on cultural basis, I'll tell you the same thing. But not God. God says, you have a good conscience when you apply the gospel truths, he says, not like Hymenaeus and Alexander. He names two people who were disciplined. They were handed over to Satan. What did they do? They blasphemed. That word blaspheme is to speak untruths about God, both in word and in action. And remember, this is said in the context of false teaching. Second Timothy tells us these people were teaching that the resurrection was already passed. That means the second resurrection of believers, already gone. 
you missed the boat, sorry, you might as well live wherever you like. I mean, Jesus has gone, and those that believe went with him, so you know, you might as well do whatever you like right now. I think there's a warning to us who are leaders and teachers and parents, myself included. If we don't hold the faith in good conscience, if we don't understand the gospel truths, if we don't model them, if we don't teach them accurately, we could be in danger of blasphemy. We are a Bible-believing church, praise God. We are very anxious to keep on the truth of the gospel. But I had a chat with Rue and Gracia yesterday. They're doing fine uh, in Minnesota. They told me, hey, pastor, we realize uh, a few things when we learn uh, from Sunday school may not be actually the case uh, when we study them now. I said, <laughs> yeah, that's quite common. Why? Because sometimes our well-meaning teachers and leaders, we assume we already know. And we don't actually read the Bible. We don't receive its truth and we don't apply it. You know, I'm going to do a litmus test next year. We discussed this during the leaders' retreat. I'm going to be running leaders and teachers' training, Bible training, because you need to receive in order to teach. I'll give you an example. David and Goliath. You read that account of David and Goliath, what do you teach? You know, in Sunday school, be like David, right? A young man went with five stones, courageous and through. Well, you know, David... David was just a human being. And there are very few of our teenagers that will go against giants, <laughs> physically. If you realize that that story is about a great God, in spite of the overwhelming odds, a great God that used this small little teenager who was anointed as what? As the king. Was chosen as the king. And in his kingly line would come the ultimate savior, Jesus Christ then the focus is not about David, but about God. About his wonderful ability to rescue and preserve his covenant people. Because in Abraham's seed will all the nations of the earth be blessed. How, how many of you teach Sunday school that way? I say, Pastor, please don't. I'm not accusing anybody. But my fear is that some of our teachers and leaders think that we know how to handle Scripture very well and we handle it wrongly. It affects the next generation. I've heard this before. Some of our youth say, I hear the same thing. I attend Sunday school and I hear the same thing over and over again. I said, I think there's something wrong with that. I fear the complacency of a Bible-believing church. A little lull of a folding of hands will have generational consequences. I think of national service. You know, some of our people um, always criticize the next generation, strawberry generation. Ah, yeah, la, they're all so weak, you know. Always put on uniform already, get injured, you know. Ah. Well, They need to be trained. They need to be given the right way to fight. They need to be modeled, regardless of their generational challenges. Paul says we're fighting a war. We're fighting a war to preserve, protect, and pass on the true gospel. He says you wage a good warfare to preserve, protect, and pass on the true faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. An impassioned plea in the theme of 1 Timothy that the real gospel changes lives. And yes, like climate change, it will impact us for many generations to come, but even more so than climate change, the impact of the gospel is for all of eternity. Therefore, since the real gospel changes lives, praise God, every day of our life, should break out in doxological praise when we realize the enormity of our sin. For who understands he is forgiven much, loves much? The real gospel is worth fighting for. And watch out. Watch out for the internal wars of our heart where we say, I struggle to keep a good conscience between God and man. 
watch out for the external aspects of the fight where the accurate gospel is presented, the accurate biblical truths are presented from generation to generation. Above all, keep our eyes on Christ, the one who is so different from us, the one who has perfect patience. Let us pray. Our Father, our eyes on Christ today, not ourselves. We see a word picture, an example in your redemption of the Apostle Paul, the Saul who was the worst of sinners and who felt it, whom Jesus Christ, whom he persecuted, extended perfect long-suffering, forbearance, patience. A patience that waited for repentance, a patience that resulted in full forgiveness, a patience that caused Saul to become Paul, the greatest missionary in the ministry. Father, we think of our own conversion. We think of the chances you've given to us. We think of ourselves as the chief of sinners, which is who we are. And we cannot but praise you for the perfect patience of Jesus Christ. Oh yes, this real gospel is worth fighting for. Give us grace to watch out, to protect, to preserve, and pass on your true gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.